In the last video, we finished off what I thought was the third and final lab on API testing, but it turns out that Portsway have created a subcategory called server-side parameter pollution. So there's two more labs that we need to cover, and today we're going to look at exploiting server-side parameter pollution in a query string. As usual, we'll start by covering the background information that's relevant to this lab, but if you've already done that or you want to just jump straight to it, you can use the relevant video chapter. Some systems contain internal APIs that aren't directly accessible from the internet. Server-side parameter pollution occurs when a website embeds user input in a server-side request to an internal API without adequate encoding. This means that an attacker may be able to manipulate or inject parameters which might enable them to override existing parameters, modify the application data, or access unauthorized data. You can test any user input for any kind of parameter pollution. For example, Query parameters, form fields, headers, and URL path parameters may all be vulnerable. This vulnerability is sometimes called HTTP parameter pollution. However, this term is also used to refer to web application firewall bypass techniques. So to avoid confusion, in this topic, we'll only refer to server-side parameter pollution. In addition, despite the similar name, the vulnerability class has little in common with server-side prototype pollution. To test for server-side parameter pollution in the query string, you can place syntax characters like the hash symbol, the ampersand, or the equals symbol into your input and observe how the application responds. Consider a vulnerable application that enables you to search for other users based on their username. When you search for a username, your browser makes the following request, so it has the name Peter, and then the back parameter is set to home. And to retrieve user information, the server queries an internal API with the following request. So it passes over the name parameter with Peter, but it also adds another parameter and public profile equals true. You can use a URL encoded hash character to attempt to truncate a server-side request. To help interpret the response, you could also add a string after the hash character. So for example, you could modify the query string we saw previously, and after the username, you put in a hash symbol, making sure that it's URL encoded, and then some string after that. The front end will try to access the following URL, so it's gonna pass this to the internal API, and then we basically want to analyze the response to see if there's any change in the behavior. It is essential that you URL encode the hash character, otherwise the front-end application will interpret as a fragment identifier and it won't be past the internal API. So we do that, we review the response for clues about whether the query has been truncated. For example, if it returns the user pizza, then the server-side query may have been truncated. If it returns an error message, say an invalid name, then the application may have treated foo as part of the username. This suggests that the server-side request may not have been truncated. If you're able to truncate the server-side request, this removes the requirement for the public profile field to be set to true, so you may be able to exploit this to return non-public user profiles. You can also use a URL encoded ampersand character to attempt to add a second parameter to the server-side request. So for example, you could modify the query string as follows. So this time they have added an and instead of a hash, it's URL encoded again and then they have included this parameter foo with a value of x, y, z. And this results in the following server-side request, the internal API, so it passes that parameter over. And again, we want to review the response and see is there any difference in how it's passed. For example, if the response is unchanged, it may indicate the parameter was successfully injected, but ignored by the application. To build up a more complete picture, we would need to test it further. If you're able to modify the query string, you can then attempt to add a second valid parameter to the server-side request. For more information on how to identify parameters that we can inject into the query string, we can also look at the Finding Hidden Parameters section in the Web Security Academy. For example, if you've identified the email parameter, you could try and add it to the query string as follows. So in this case, they've just done the same as you did previously, but they've changed the XYZ parameter to equal email. And that will result in the following server-side request where you have the email being provided as foo. And again, we just review the response and see if there's any difference in how it's passed. To confirm whether an application is vulnerable to server-side parameter pollution, you could try and override the original parameter. You can do this by injecting a second parameter with the same name. So for example, you can modify the query string to the following. In this case, we've got two names, but remember we have to URL encode the and symbol, and we've used two different names. So both of those names will be sent to the internal API, and the impact of this depends on how the application processes the second parameter. That will vary across different web technologies. For example, PHP passes the last parameter only, so this would result in a user search for Carlos. ASP.NET 
combines both parameters. So this would result in a user search for Peter, comma, Carlos, which might result in an invalid username error message. And Node.js and Express pass the first parameter only. So this would result in a user search for Peter, giving an unchanged result. If you're able to override the original parameter, you may be able to conduct an exploit. For example, you could add name equals administrator to the request, and this may enable you to log in as the administrator user. Okay, theory stuff out of the way, let's take a look at the lab. The description just tells us to log in as the administrator and delete Carlos. So a very simple one, we've got some required knowledge which we should have by now. As usual, we might go and have a look at the site functionality here. What can we do with these products? Doesn't look like we can do too much. We can go to my account, but we weren't given any credentials this time. So maybe we could just try Wiener and Pizza anyway, but it says it's invalid. So let's check out this other functionality, which is the forgotten password. And we know that we want to get the password for the administrator. So let's just put that in, click submit, and it tells us it sent it to, and then it's redacted the email address. Obviously we don't have access to that. so. Let's have a look at the HTTP history and see what's going on. We've sent the login request. Let us, oh, that was a login. Now we want to send the forgotten password to the repeater. We'll have a play around with this. But I also noticed here we've got this static slash JS slash forgotten password. So you could have a look at that in here. Or if we go to the forgotten password page and then hit F12, we can bring up our debugger and have a look at the code here instead. So here's our JavaScript. We've got the forgotten password ready function. We have got a URL encode form data, a validation function, and here's our post request. So this is the post request that's made whenever we say we've forgotten our password. But we also have then a get request to forgotten password reset token equals. So let's have a look and see what this page looks like. Let's just go here and put in a random token and it comes back and says invalid token. So not really much use, but it's something that we could go and play around with in the burp repeater as well. Let us first go back to the post request that we created to forgotten password. One of the things it told us was that if we do two parameters, so we do username equals administrator, then we'll do a second username and say it's Carlos, and we need to make sure this is URL encoded. So you can right click and go to encode somewhere, convert selection, URL, and then URL encode, or you can just do control and U or control shift and U to undo that. So just a quick way if you're not too familiar with burp. And if we click send, does it come back? Okay, so it's not really clear because it doesn't actually come back with the username. So we don't know which one actually went through there. Let's see what else we can do. If we put in an a incorrect username, it tells us that it was invalid, okay. And how about if we put in a random parameter? Let's do the ampersand again. Let's change, in fact, not, not a random parameter. Let's do reset token because that's the one that we just found here. Let's set it to equal one, two, three. URL encode the ampersand and send, and it says the parameter is not supported. Okay, um, what else can we do then? Let us do the hash symbol to see if there's anything that we can comment out basically before it's sent to the internal API. So I'll put that here and I'll also put here test as well. If this comes back and says that the username is not known, then it means that this has been forwarded to the backend. Whereas if it'll come back and say that it's just administrator, we'll know that it's been truncated. But actually it comes back saying field not specified. So it looks like it might have truncated it. If we now try and say the field parameter should be something, let us do, let me take that out again, the hash symbol, and we'll URL encode this, and then we'll set this to field is equal to one, two, three, send. And this time we get invalid field. So yeah, it looks like whenever we put in the hash symbol, we truncated what was being sent to the internal API, which included a field parameter, which we don't have control over. But what we can do is then basically say, we don't want to use that field variable. So now let's also do a hash at the end. So we're basically saying anything that's sent to the internal API after this hash shouldn't be included, but we do want to include this field and specify that ourselves. But we need to work out what kind of fields it'll actually take. So Next part is we'll send this through to the burp intruder. And you can see I've already got that highlighted because it was already highlighted whenever I sent it through. But if not, you can just use these add and clear in order to set the marker. And we're just saying we want to loop through this value. And what do we want to send to it? Well, you can actually select from a list here some preset options. So there is one for server side variable names, which will come up with some potentially interesting values. And that's it, we'll just hit start. We'll go and have a look. Is there any difference in the lengths of these responses? Is there any difference in the status codes? 
And there is, we've got two which are a different length of the rest and a different status code as well. So let's go and try the username and the email field. I'm going back to the repeater and we'll change it to email. Click send and see what it says. It comes back with the email. Okay, change it to username, send, and it comes back with the administrator. Okay, I wonder if we take out that hash symbol, does it actually make any difference? Doesn't look like it, okay. So what if we set this to the other field that we found, which was reset token and click send? we get a reset token back. So if we just go and put this now into our browser with this get request and hit enter, it asks us for a password. I'm gonna put in cats and it has returned us to the homepage. Let's go and try and log in with administrator and cats. There we go, we're logged in. We can go to the admin panel and we can delete the user Carlos. And that's it. That's how we can solve the exploit in server-side parameter pollution in a query string. So this was technically, I think, the fourth API testing lab. We've got one more left, which is an expert lab, and it's called exploit in server-side parameter pollution in a REST URL. Anyway, that is going to wrap it up for this video. As usual, let me just recommend that you sign up to the Integrity platform. If you want to find some API vulnerabilities and get paid for it, it's a good place to start. Anyway, hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have any questions or comments, leave them down below. Thanks. Bye.